This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. The Hot Herd Tell Show, it is February the 9th. It is a Wednesday. We're halfway through the week, and the year of our Lord 2022 just continues to roll on. So glad you've decided to spend a little bit of the most precious thing you have, your time with us. We're not going to waste a minute of it today. So much to cover on the show today. Uh, Remember the AstraZeneca vaccine? Whatever happened to that? A little story out of Britain. We're going to talk about the vaccines a bit. We're also going to talk about abuse in the Catholic Church. There's some news out of the last pope, who is now the Pope Emeritus. Benedict XVI has released a statement. We'll touch in on that. Our friend Dennis Saunders, back on the show, uh, a favorite of ours, thoughtful man, a man I listen to very carefully, whether I agree with him or not. I always want his opinion and viewpoint on things. He is a writer and a good friend of ours, contributor to Ordinary-Times.com, but he's also a pastor, and he lives in Minneapolis, a city that has seen way too much uh, attention on issues of social justice, on police, and other things. And we have another one, the Amir Locke situation. We're going to talk to Dennis Saunders in depth about that on the program today. Uh, also end the day on a story about you never know what you might find at a garage and or yard sale. Buy it. Might be worth $10 million and be part of a famous artist's repertoire. You just never know, folks. But let's start with a story you've been asking for us to cover, uh, the trucker convoy in Canada. They have now occupied Ottawa right in front of Parliament House, the seat of power in Canada. The situation is fluid. They're on day 11 or 12 of it now um, as we record this program. There's a lot going on here. We hadn't commented on it because we have spent several days looking into it, talking to sources, talking to people on the ground, trying to get a handle on what's actually happening here. Now, I want to preface all this with a couple of things. There's some things going on with this convoy on the government side and the Canada side that I don't like. Um, Using the GoFundMe page, target people, using that information to go after people. There's some real highly questionable stuff there. I'm no fan of Justin Trudeau. I find him feckless. I find him to be a hollow man of a lot of noise and not a lot of substance, but I'm not Canadian. I'm an American, so I can say what I want. Canadians can elect the leader they want. That's fine. Just my opinion. I find the man uh, wanting in many, many areas for many, many reasons, not just his past controversies, but the way he conducts himself. I find him to be a lightweight on the world stage for a country who does not need a lightweight at this time in history. Just my opinion. Having said all of that, um, let's deal with this trucker convoy. When I see a movement like this, we have to stop, get past the buzzwords, turn down the noise, what we're always talking about, and find out what's really going on. Now, what they say is going on. Now, what does signs say? What's really going on? How do you find that out? 
when you're dealing with a movement like this, there's two places you will always get to the truth very rapidly if you pursue them. Who is the leadership and follow the money. Following the money when it's a government thing, an organizational thing, even a household thing. If I want to find out a lot about what you are as a person, your money and how you spend it will tell me a lot about how you are as a person. Your organization is the same way. Our government's the same way. That's why we harp on government accountability so much. Our government is telling us they don't care by the way they handle our fiscal house here in America. But that's for another time. Follow the money. There's been a lot of outrage over the GoFundMe thing, and I think there's some validity to that. Why did they take it down? Yada, yada, yada. There was $9 million raised for this group. Uh, we can talk about GoFundMe at some other point, but after GoFundMe, another rival site raised $5 million. Can we just stop for a second? Why does this protest need $9 million? Why do they need another $5 million? Do you know where that money's going? Oh, well, it's going to the trucker. Do you know that? Have you followed up on that? Do you understand the infrastructure involved in managing and accurately and with open transparency, managing $5 million or $9 million in donations and distributing that to multiple individuals? You should be asking questions about such things like that, where the money's going, what organizations are really behind this. Second one, the leadership, who's in charge. Uh, I don't care what your organization says it's about. What's your leadership about? What do their actions tell me they're about? There is the leadership that is forward-facing in these people, the viral video folks, the folks that are at the forefront, very questionable individuals. You're going to do your own homework here. We're not going to lay it all out for you, but it'll take you just a few minutes and a few clicks. You can read media reports. You can go through these folks' own social media. The forward-facing leadership of these folks are not good people. They're not good faith actors. They have some very bad ideas. They are not friends of freedom, no matter how much they're screaming about freedom, which is why some of their tactics involve taking freedom from other people while they're screaming for freedom for them. These are things we all need to balance. Now, if this upsets you because you like your social media narratives nice, clean, and simple, I'm sorry. That's not what we do here. The leadership of these people are suspect. The way they're handling their money is suspect. The tactics they are using are suspect. In fact, their new pronounced uh, spokesman, uh, Mazzaro, I think I'm pronouncing this right, cannot go more than about a minute in his press conference he held yesterday without getting into the vaccines are unsafe and getting into anti-vax narrative. Is this really what people say it's about? Now, not everybody that are participating in these things are bad people. Not every one of them have bad ties with things like far-right extremism and racist groups and things like this. A lot of those people are probably just normal people that are joining the protest. But that's why I'm telling you it's so important to follow the money and check the leadership because people get sucked into these things. And things like this are magnets for people that are bad faith actors. We're already seeing it spread. There are people now calling for this to continue in the United States. There are people who are calling for a similar operation to come to America. Again, we're not going to lay it all out for you. You need to do your own homework. I've spent a couple of days reading through this stuff, talking to folks. We're working on getting some guests on that can explain this in great detail, and we'll continue to cover it. I'm telling you, there's parts to this story that are not organic. There are parts to this story that are our work. And I mean a work in the old pro wrestling term, meaning it's not what it appears to be. It's being manipulated for your enjoyment to watch. So now when a certain talking head who has the most popular primetime news network program has somebody on like Ezra Levant from Rebel Media, who is a very bad actor, who is a clearinghouse for getting stuff that would otherwise be banned from proper media and washing it and laundering it back into the media cycle from these far extremist groups on his program as some kind of herald for what's going on up there, it's time to start talking about it in America and start asking some hard questions. Just because people put freedom labels on it and it wears a freedom coat and it uses freedom words doesn't mean they're really about freedom. I understand Canadian system is a little different than ours. Canada has their own rules. That's for the Canadian people to sort out. We support people that want to have freedom, but is your freedom the same definition of freedom that we have. If you're populating uh, conspiracy theories, if you're populating bad actors, if you're taking gobs of money and funneling them to groups with known ties to extremist groups, to hate groups, 
to people who are anti-Semitic, to people who are racist. And then you just scream, you don't like freedom. If anybody questions any of this very obvious information that's out there to look at, you're not really about freedom. You're about something else. And it's on you to explain to us why you're about that something else. We're allowed to question it. We should, especially when there's a lot of money involved, especially when there's all kinds of online activity uh, one person who studies this, uh, I won't quote them directly because I want to try to get them on the program to talk about, said this is the biggest group of troll and bot websites around a single event that they have seen since the 2016 election. That's really saying something. Why is so many bad faith actors jumping all over this? You should have your suspect radar up on this trucker convoy. All is not appear as it is. Don't slam it into your American narrative or your online bubble and think it applies when there's some very suspect things going on here. Dig into it yourself. Do your own research. Do your own homework. For God's sakes, quit giving people like this your money and understand the times that we live in. Discernment is the most important thing we can do with our media. That's why we talk about turning down the noise here. That's why we talk to knowledgeable guests. And when it comes to something like this trucker convoy, which is about to come to America, if they can help it at all, and is about to probably get very, very ugly in Ottawa, and they're going to blame everybody but themselves for escalating the situation, and that doesn't mean the police probably won't do stupid crap, and that doesn't mean Trudeau might overreact and other government officials. We'll call everybody out equally if it comes to it. But we better nip this in the bud. You better learn how to discern these kind of news stories, because they're coming your way, whether you like it or not. And you're not going to be able to buzzword it away if it starts affecting things like the economy, like boycotts, like shutting down the trucking industry, all for bad faith actors to get more money, more power, and more attention. There's nothing freedom about that. More her tale right after this. Now let me see you go off like a bomb. Welcome back to Herd Tell Show. I'm Andrew Donson. Thank you so much for taking some time to spend with us today. We sure do appreciate it, however you're watching or listening. Thanks a lot for being here. Uh, unpleasant topic, but we've covered it before. Uh, we have talked about things like abuse, like power structure abuse, like abuse of children and women and other peoples. Uh, it's an important topic because, again, this is a culture and politics podcast, but both of those are studies of people and how people behave and how people treat each other affect our culture and politics greatly. Uh, we know about these scandals in the Catholic Church. Full disclosure, I am not Catholic, so you can figure that in however you want. But uh, I'm a Baptist, and the Baptist Church is having all kinds of abuse issues, too, and we're covering them as well. So fair is fair, but in this particular case, we're back to talking about our Catholic friends. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI, who is Pope Emeritus, retired, uh, doesn't do a lot of public media, doesn't do a lot of statements, tries to kind of stay out. He's in very ill health, we understand. Washington Post, Pope Benedict XVI apologizes for clerical abuse, but admits no personal responsibility. Now, I'm going to take a pause here real quick. When we have experts on about abuse, we had Jennifer Greenberg on the podcast. Uh, go back and listen to that podcast. It's one of the first ones we ever did, and we did that on purpose because the topic is so important. E abuse happens inside of power structures, and power structures that are not held accountable and do not have good people in them and are not well-maintained are magnets for people who are abusers because they operate inside the power structure to give them cover for the wicked deeds they do. It's one of the things that Jennifer Greenberg talked on this program about. Please go back and listen to that. Support her. Follow her. She's got a great book out called Not Forsaking about abuse in the church, although she's talking about the Protestant church in America. But the all those things apply broadly, whether it's a church, whether it's an organization, whether it's the government, a political organization or just the family structure where there's a power structure or a patriarchal structure, or even a matriarchal structure can be abusive. It's always a power structure involves somebody's on top. They've got to be protected. Their deeds have to be swept under the rug for the good of everybody else. It's the same story over and over and over again. It's just when it's the Catholic church and it's worldwide and it involves a huge amount of people and a huge amount of abuse victims and a huge amount of abusers and a whole lot of money. It's scaled way, way up. Anyway, to the Washington Post article, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI on Tuesday expressed his, quote, profound shame to the victims of clerical abuse and said he was pained by errors, that's in quotes, that occurred in various places across his career in the church. But he stopped short of acknowledging any specific personal responsibility after a church commission German report accused him of mishandling four cases during his time running the Archdiocese of Munich between 1977 
in 1982. Quote, however great my fault may be today, the Lord forgives me if I sincerely allow myself to be examined by him and I am really prepared to change. The 94-year-old retired Pope wrote, those were, that's a direct quote. At the same time, Tuesday, a legal and academic team that had assisted Benedict offered a full-throated defense saying that Benedict, known then as Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, was never involved in any cover-up or act of abuse. The cover-up and act of abuse is, again, in quotes. I'm reading this, so I want to make sure what he actually says and what is in peace. That's why I'm telling you the quotes. The canon lawyers, <laughs> the canon lawyers and academics said the German investigation was short on evidence to prove its claims. Let's just stop right here. This is insufficient. I don't care if it's the retired Pope Emeritus. I don't care if it's the current Pope. I don't care who it is. There is major accountability to be had here, and the Catholic Church has a long documented history of covering up, excusing, justifying, and sweeping things under the rug for the quote-unquote greater good. It's no better for them to do it than when an abusive father does it in a household or when a government agency does it. It's wrong. They need to come out plainly against this. Now, I'm sorry if that really offends you. I'm not just picking on Catholics here. The Southern Baptists have a problem with abuse right now. They got the same problem. I said the same thing about their organization. You ought to run every single one of them out. Anybody that will not have an open investigation has no business being in any place of power, any place of authority, and sure shouldn't be in a place to influence other people to do their bidding to keep things under wraps for the quote-unquote greater good. That's always a lie without exception. It's a lie since we're talking church. It's a lie right out of the pit of hell because that's where this stuff comes from, that any one person, any one organization has to be protected at the expense of an abuse victim is morally offensive. It's offensive to anybody with a functional frontal cortex. Yes, this is harsh, but let's quit playing patty foot with this kind of stuff. The organizations are rotten from the top down from years and years of being trained that it's okay for them to do this, to excuse it, and to soft pedal it when they get caught. And when you quit tolerating it, we shouldn't tolerate it from the Catholic Church. We shouldn't tolerate it from a Baptist church. We shouldn't tolerate it from whatever religious organization you're in. You shouldn't tolerate it from a family member, and you sure shouldn't tolerate it from your government. But they will continue to do so because what we started with, they are power structures. And people that do bad deeds are drawn to power structures so that they can operate in the cracks of them and get cover for them and excuse their wickedness and hide it and cloak it in things like politics and religion and culture and other things. It's just more words capped off on evil. Just call the evil evil and demand accountability for those that didn't prevent it, that didn't stop it, and won't let anybody be held accountable for it. More Heard Tell right after this. Hi, welcome to Hurtel. This is our buddy Dennis Saunders, one of our favorites, one of our go tos. Man, I greatly respect his opinion on a variety of things. And unfortunately, my friend, we are once again talking about your beloved city of Minneapolis. Yeah, I would like to sometime come on and not talk about uh, any type of police shooting because there's a lot of other things going on in Minneapolis. Let's just start right there, though, because when we when we talked about other issues up there with you. Um, George Floyd, Chauvin, um, even the stuff that went in happened in Kenosha, which was adjacent to that. There was an environmental element to that. We went into the back history. I don't want to rehash it all here, but this see, this keeps happening in Minneapolis for a reason, does it not? I think it does. Um, you know, I think part of it is that the police department has long had a history of of problem. Uh, cops that they haven't really dealt with. Uh, I think a lot of that has had to deal with the police union. And to type, I think to top it all off with that is dealing kind of with the racial element. And that's all, also been there. It's been a kind of a longstanding part of it. So until those two things are addressed, this is going to keep happening. All right. Amir Locke, this is the new one. Um, before we get into the details of it, how has it landed in the city? You're there uh, you're a writer, but you're also a pastor in the community. So th- this this is your this is where you live, work, and eat and play. Uh, how's the community taking this one? Well, there is a lot of justifiable anger, and um, 
you know, this was actually brought up at church yesterday um, in our in our um, prayers. So there are lots of people that are are upset, and I think again because this is happening again, we've had as a community dealt with a number of police shootings, and I think going at least as far back as Philando Castile in 2016. Uh, of course, George Floyd in 2020, and now with Amir Locke. And all of these are things that really, the way that they were handled, they shouldn't have happened. But there you go. From my perspective, I phrase it this way. You tell me if I'm on off base, though, with, but with what we know now, and this is early and these things always change as we go, but what we know right now on the Amir Locke shooting, mm-hmm. uh, killing, let's just call it a killing. Uh- this feels to me almost like we took the worst parts of Philando Castile and the worst parts of Brianna Taylor. And it's exactly. almost like it's almost like they've been combined here because we have a legal gun owner. We have a, a no knock warrant into a home. We have now, uh, I think, sufficient evidence to say that the way they went about getting the warrant was suspect at best. This seems like it's those two things at its worst. Is that how it's landing with the community there? You know, I think it is. I mean, I think because um, George, I mean, Breonna Taylor, I think is sooner people are bringing that up, but I think it's a combination of both. One of the things that's been interesting, and and if there is a silver lining, um, is that you've heard um, statements from the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus, um, basically chastising the police um, and talking about Amir Locke as a legal gun owner. Um, that was something that didn't happen um, with Philando Castile. They never brought up the fact that he was a gun owner, or a lot of, of gun rights groups never brought that up. Of course, we're still waiting for the NRA to talk about that, but of course, they're busy these days. But I think that that is a positive, um, is that we are kind of seeing this as this is someone who is a legal gun owner. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He had a right to carry um, a weapon and got shot. And this is, I mean, it's kind of happened again. Um, The other thing I think that is important to talk about is the fact that this was the whole background about this was about uh, a murder investigation that took place uh, that was being handled by the St. Paul Police Department. And so St. Paul was asking Minneapolis to check on this. And they, St. Paul expressly said, do not do a no-knock warrant. And Minneapolis decided just to go right ahead. They thought they knew better. They had, um, they knew the situation. But I think that that's what's also frustrating is that uh, Minneapolis police did not even listen to uh, their uh, sister police department across the river. Is there been, and it seems weird to ask this in the, in the light of what has just happened, but has there been a noticeable change in the Minneapolis Police Department? I know there was leadership changes. I know there was a lot of lip service, but has there been a noticeable change in the police department in the last year, 18 months? Um, I would especially since maybe since the, the Chauvin verdict, and then we have the ongoing trials with the other individuals. But is there any palpable difference in the police before this happened? Or is this just come up and everybody's going, wait a minute, nothing's really changed? It's pretty much the latter. Nothing's really changed. Um now, there could be some reasoning for that because, of course, um, the uh, federal government is looking at the police department and seeing what type of civil rights violations have taken place. So they may be waiting for that. But there still should have been something done. Um, there was a lot that could have been done, and it hasn't. And I, I think that that's, that's bad uh, for a lot of reasons. It's bad because you know, last year, there were lots of people who wanted to basically do away with the police department. And, you know, of course, we need a police department. But we need a police department that's going to be reformed, and that's going to be acting better. And um, that we're not, especially for me as an African American, not afraid that they're going to shoot you. Um, And, you know, that's where we are right now. Yeah, we're talking to our friend Dennis Saunders. He's up in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. Uh, he's not only a writer and a good friend of ours, he's also a pastor in the community, so he knows this community well. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because one thing that really seems to bother me about this is since we went through um, all the stuff with George Floyd and then all the other things that happened subsequent to that, we all 
you know, I feel like we wasted yet another opportunity to actually talk about these issues. And the way it gets wasted is everybody runs to one extreme or the other, either mm-hmm. abolish the police and all police are horrible, which we know just objectively isn't true. And they run the and then the right will run the other way and they get on the rampart of, well, the police have to be backed no matter what. Mm-hmm. And as far as I can tell from what I study and learn about this subject, both of those are equally going to get people killed. Yeah, it is. Um, because I think what like, you know, especially with you to the, the, the fund of police, what that does is that it basically stops the argument. I mean, stops any type of reform or any talk because then everyone's just talking about that one issue you know whether we want to get rid of the police or not and the same thing when it's you know the other way around on the right is that everyone's focused then on the extremes and they're not focused on the issue at hand um you know i think that that was one of the major problems right after george floyd there was some movement especially in washington um, to hopefully get some something happening, but you know everyone was focused on either defunding the police or you know we the police need to be backed up no matter what, and we didn't really sit down hammer out how can we prevent this from happening, and you know that's kind of what's been happening here, and and I fear it's gonna it's gonna happen again. Yeah, talking to our friend Dennis Saunders. Um, since you brought it up anyway, is the lesson to this, uh, the one size fit all from Washington is just never going to work. It's probably never going to get passed anyway, but it, it just isn't applicable because you have, uh, like you just said, Minneapolis, St. Paul, you have the Twin Cities. That's kind of a unique situation where they're very um, inseparable in a lot of ways. That's different than other metro areas. That's certainly going to be different than a rural area or a sheriff's department that has to deal with things. Uh, we've seen the situation with Aubrey uh, down in Georgia, where it was more of a rural situation, a suburban situation, and you had corrupt prosecutors. Is the lesson here that we really need to maybe stop thinking about a one size fit all bill, and this is going to have to be a local level area first type of reform movement? I think it is, um, just because the police are is a local issue. Um, I, I think you, you just brought up Ahmad Arbery, and. If I'm not mistaken, there was a, a certain law that was was kind of being used by by his killers to justify um, the killing. Georgia was very quick in getting rid of that law, um, and it was a law that had been around since the Civil War. Uh, that's basically, of course, where it would work because it's it's the local issue. It was very specific to Georgia. Um, and it's going to have to work here, too, in, in Minnesota. I mean, I think the state um, House and the state Senate are going to have to work on this with the governor. Um, this is just going to be have to be a local issue. Um, you know, Washington can, can help in some ways, but ultimately the police, any type of police is a local thing. It's not. And any any solution has to come from the local because Washington isn't going to be knowledgeable of what some certain cities or a, a, a small town or a rural area will need. Yeah. We're talking to our buddy, Dennis Saunders. He is in Minneapolis. He knows these issues intimately well, because unfortunately this is his third or fourth time on this program talking about them. Uh, when we come back, we're going to dig into some of those specifics of Minneapolis, the specifics of this case, as we know it, continue to get his great insight on it. More with Dennis Saunders on her tell right after that. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. Hope you enjoyed that nice long break. Uh, we're back with Dennis Saunders, our buddy. All right, let's get into the specifics of this case a little bit. Before we go to Amir Locke, though, uh, I always, anytime this happens, I always like to zoom out to a government accountability. Uh, the police is the armed enforcement wing of the government. So if you're a uh, accountability, a government person, that includes the police. Let's start with the mayor. Uh, I have not been impressed. I wasn't impressed when he did his street dancing routine and basically got shouted down by the mob during the George Floyd protest. I was not impressed with what I saw at the podium uh, a couple of days ago in the aftermath of this. But you're local. You're on the ground. What is the sentiment about y'all's mayor and his leadership? I I think most people would agree with you. Um, You know, he won a second term. And supposedly this was an issue 
a no knock warrants was an issue that he wanted to to, to um, tackle. And as far as we know, he hadn't done anything yet. Um, and now for that to happen, it doesn't look good for him. It does, it looks it basically shows poor leadership on on his part. And you know we need someone that is going to basically, I, I think, be willing to say to the police department, "This is what you got to do," um, and not take no for an answer. And you know, I don't think he has every power available to do something, but I, he does ha- have at least some type of moral power. And I think right now he's not really showing that. Yeah. And one thing that, and again, we're just working off the information as we have it now, these cases, of course, there'll be an investigation where there'll be more things come out, but as it stands right now, the part that really smells bad to this case so far is it sure looks like not just that they got a no knock warrant, but it looks like they went no knock warrant shopping to get it. That's, I think, the thing that is, I think, annoying is that they wanted to do this, um, even though, especially as I said earlier, St. Paul said, do not do this. This is something they wanted to do. I don't I don't get that. I don't. If you're so did you they not think that doing this could what the consequences were? Obviously, they didn't. Obviously, they did not care about the consequences because they were they wanted to get their way and they didn't care what was going to happen. Yeah. And of all people, the uh, Derek Chauvin judge is the one that actually signed off on this thing just to really make it complicated. Yeah. Um, Here's where I'm at on it. uh, And then I'll get your thoughts on it. Um, I I don't go so far as to say you need to ban no knock warrants because there's probably some situations you need it. I think the standards should be really, really high. I think this should be a really hard thing for the police to get. I don't like what I'm reading and understanding of this situation because it seems like they went shopping to get it. They had a no-knock warrant for multiple locations. Uh, The person that was shot was not on any of these warrants. He wasn't wanted for anything as far as anybody can tell. Uh, He was a legal gun owner. But a no-knock warrant surely should not be a fishing expedition. And when you get one for three locations, that sure sounds like a fishing expedition you should not be doing the most dangerous situation you can put a police officer in as a fishing situation. Am I wrong in laying that out? Was there anything inaccurate there? No, I don't think there's anything inaccurate there. You know, let's think about this for a moment. A a no-knock warrant is basically, it's probably one of the most extreme things that a government can do because you're basically saying that the government can trespass on your property. They don't have to announce themselves. They are coming in with lethal force. At the very least, that seems to be something that you're going to, you want to handle with some sense of caution. And um, that wasn't done here. Minneapolis, I think the police department was incredibly careless, if not, if not callous in how they were handling this. Now let's get to the gritty part of this. Um, When they go into it now, we, now there's some, there's some discrepancy on what the actual lapse time here is because the release video is a uh, slow mode one to keep it from being too graphic and two, because they're hiding the voices until the investigations uh, complete. I understand all that. So somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10 seconds from taking the door, the shots are fired. There's two issues at hand here. One is we all understand that if the police are coming in with guns drawn and somebody picks up a weapon, they're going to get shot. Mm -hmm. My concern here is twofold. One is he had a right to be in that home with a gun. He was licensed to carry that gun. Even if he wasn't licensed, he would have had a right to have it in the home. Um, And he was not wanted. And two is the situation where they were coming in guns drawn at the ready was completely set up by their own hand. And as we talked about before, under suspect circumstances, I get the police officer pulling the trigger in the situation, but the entire situation to me was built up and escalated once again by the police. And therefore the accountability on this is all on the police to explain it. And I think they should be held accountable for it. I do not disagree, but this is, this is one of the problems here in Minneapolis is that In many ways, the police is not accountable. They have done whatever they feel is correct, where there have been um, issues with police. And in fact, the person that did um, um, shoot Amir was someone that had a record of problems. That person should not have even actually been taking part in that no-knock warrant. 
not that I think that they, that should have happened at all, but if you're going to have it, you, you don't want someone that has had several complaints already. And again, this shows kind of the, the ability of the police to not basically to say that they don't have any accountability at all. They feel that they are a law unto themselves. And that's not a good thing for our city because we, as I said, we do need a police. Um, we're a large American city. Crime does happen. Crime has increased in Minneapolis. We need to have a police. But as I like to say, I want to have a police, but I don't want to call the police and worry about if they're going to shoot me. And I think that's kind of where we're at right now. The other problem I have with this is, and I'm going to quote our buddy, Will Truman, who's also our boss at Ordinary Times when we write there. Mm -hmm. He wrote one of the best articles I've ever read on, read on this. It's called Hollow Points and Hollow Rights. And he just lays it out bluntly. He's like, it's not a right if the police don't have to respect it. And I saw two rights violations here. I see the right of them coming into the home on the no-knock warrant that is that it sure looks like it's suspect, especially when we start looking into the people that are involved and that they had uh, violence issues already. Um, we'll see how that plays out, but that, that sure looks like there may be some connectable dots there. And he had a right to have that weapon. Eight to 10 seconds of reaction time from a dead sleep. The man reached for a gun. I, I can't get right with that. No, there's no. no police procedure for that. There's no. And when you put together that they shop the warrant, nothing about this feels right. I'm going to go back to like the George Floyd thing and the Breonna Taylor thing and the Ahmed Aubrey. There's nothing when you look at this objectively that feels right. And therefore, there's just nothing common sense wise that justifies it on the face of it. I just can't get there. I mean, is that where you're at? Yes, there is nothing that justifies this. No, I, and I understand that the police have a dangerous job, and there are cases where I think that they are wholly justified in using lethal force. But the situation that this was was handled, there was no need for this. There was no need to just come in, and then basically that they set themselves up for this, in that they barged in to someone who is hard, who is fast asleep, wakes up, and doesn't have a whole lot of time to react, and probably just basically as a, a reaction just reaches for it for his gun and immediately is, is killed there is no reason no thought put behind all of this uh, it was just basically let's just rush in we'll just get the get who we need and that's it as i said earlier this is something that i think is was careless but on top of that i think it, it was also callous i don't think that the police department gave a damn who was there and who was going to get hurt. Yeah. I, I think a lot of the problems when we're talking about these uh, criminal justice issues is we've done too much othering the criminal <laughs> and the police officers. I'm, I, I said it on this program a couple of days ago, a few people got upset, but that's okay. Um, you know, send, send tweet as the kids say, you cannot tell me you care or love about something. If you don't hold it accountable if you care about justice and criminal law and law and order and the police, and I do care about the police because we need them, you have to hold them accountable. I think we've just had an entire generation of police, at least my lifetime's worth, where we have escalated and escalated and escalated the mentality of everybody's out to get them. And I understand, again, the job's dangerous, but we have the militarization of the police. We have this escalation of a police mindset of shoot first, shoot second, shoot third. And then if anybody's left alive, ask some questions. And that may sound harsh, but that's, that's where we're at because we have, we have this paradigm now of police versus everybody. And we have lost the, in my opinion, especially in cities, we have lost the concept of peace officers and that they are supposed to be the de-escalating force in the community. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and I'm not even trying to make a point here. I'm just kind of venting. I don't know how you fix that because it took a, it took a couple generations to get there. I don't think you're going to fix the current generation that's already inculcated with it. What do we do? Well, one of the problems, especially here in Minneapolis, but I think nationwide is, and you just said it, police are supposed to be peace officers, or as someone once said, police are supposed to be viewed as guardians but the problem is, is that a lot of the training has them viewed as warriors. Um, 
And there is a big difference between those two. Um, one is supposed to protect people. The other is supposed to kill people. Um, those are just the two different functions. And there has been a lot of training um, that focuses on a warrior. And when you have that kind of a, a mentality, and I'm not, I don't want to trash the whole concept of the warrior, but that's something that you have. That's why we have a military. That's what a military does. A police, that's not what you do. And when you have that type of mentality taking place among the police, this is what you get is you start to not see, you start to see people as combatants, not as uh, citizens and, and to look at them and, and realize and find ways of, as you said, to de-escalate situations, not to come in guns blazing. Yeah. I think it's sad um, as somebody who's had some of that real training, when we have police departments that wouldn't be in line with LOAC, that's law of armed conflict or just the rules of engagement of war and especially the low act training and escalation of violence training and force use of force training that the military has to abide by when they're, when they really are in those situations overseas and our police would not meet those standards. There, there's something bad wrong, but that's another, that's another no, topic for the other but, day, but that that's the case. You, but I think they're, yeah. they're doing stuff that if we did it in Iraq, you'd be in Leavenworth for 20 years. No questions asked. And they're getting away with it. Yeah, but, and I, I agree. I think our, our military has rules of engagement. I mean, they actually have all of these rules to, that justifies when you can use force and not. So even with the police, when they do this warrior training, it's not necessarily training even as a, as a true warrior because there are certain ways that, that our, our, our army, our military are trained and they're just trained as, as if, to be a warrior is that you just go off and and kill with wanton wantonly. Yeah, it goes back. I think that callousness is something we're going to have to really talk about. And I and I will bet money if it comes to a trial that will come up. Uh, Dennis Saunders, we got to leave it there. I hate to because I could talk to you all day. Uh, I always respect your opinion and your insight, especially on things that are happening in your backyard. Let folks know how they can follow you. Uh, you're a brilliant writer. Uh, you write at ordinary-times.com with us frequently, but tell folks what else you got going on. I know you got your medium page and your social media. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I do have, uh, you can follow me on social media at, at uh, Denman. Um, it's on, on, on Twitter. So it's at D-E-N-M-I-N-N. -N -N. Um, you can also uh, listen to my uh, podcast, which is um, En Route, and you can find that at enroutepodcast.org. Yeah, his podcast is great. I've been on it a couple of times. He delves into uh, religion and politics. Those two things you're not supposed to talk about in front of polite <laughs> company. Uh, so make sure you follow him. Good guy, buddy. I appreciate your time today. I appreciate you jumping on short notice. And uh, we'll talk again real soon, my friend. All right. Take care. Thank you, sir. back to Hurtel. A lot of people talking about vaccines and there's been a lot of controversy, a lot of debate over the vaccines. Um, if you listen to this program, you know where we're at on it. Uh, if you have honest questions about the vaccine, those are all fine. We should not get into rabbit hole conspiracy theories about the vaccines, though. You can have honest questions about how they were developed, how they are appropriated, what's correct for getting people to have them. Should there be mandates? Should there be not mandates? Oh, what's an appropriate age to get the vaccines? Those are all legitimate questions. No, there's not nanobots going into the vaccine that's going to turn you into a zombie. No, the government isn't making it a giant conspiracy to mind control people and the other nonsense that goes with the vaccines. We can have adult conversations about vaccines without going into la-la kooky conspiracy land. However, over at the BBC News Service, uh, there's a question about uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Something interesting happened with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Not very many people ever got it. Um, the headline from uh, Fergus Walsh, medical editor over at BBC News, did nationalism spoil, quote, Britain's gift to the world? It starts out this way. In the UK, nearly half of the adult population has received two doses of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine. It seems highly likely to have saved more lives here to date than the Pfizer or Moderna jabs combined. Yet it is now barely used in the National Health Service, more than 37 million people have received a booster dose in the UK. Just 48,000 of those were AstraZeneca. The vaccine has been sidelined in the U EU and was never approved in the United States. By the way, when we did our Australia episode, 
Same thing there. They were going back and forth on the AstraZeneca thing when we had Emily Dial. And you can go back and listen to that uh, version of the Herd Tell podcast. So how did we end up here? I've been talking to scientists, politicians, and commenters about the fate of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine billed by ministers as Britain's gift to the world for a documentary on BBC Two. And I've been asking the central question, did politics and national interest get in the way of ambitions for the vaccines? The question, did nationalism play into this? Partially, there's a lot of EU Britain stuff that is unresolved to this day. That's why we have our UK contributors come on the program and explain UK things to us all the time. Uh, Sure, the EU has all kinds of machinations. Let's not even get into the fact that the EU and the World Health Organization had all kinds of problems with China and other nefarious actors in this pandemic to start with. But was it just nationalism? Maybe. But I did what we always do. We talked to somebody who's done the yeoman's work on these things. I asked our buddy, Michael Siegel, who's contributes to this program regularly. And he had an alternate theory. The AstraZeneca vaccine was more of a traditional vaccine where the MRNA vaccines were the new hotness. They were sexier. They were more cutting edge and like a shiny new toy in the way that Michael explained it to me, those got the attention more. So was it nationalism? Was it politics? Was it just some good old fashioned bias against one way of doing it as opposed to another that made better headlines and a better story? The answer appears to be yes. As with many things, when it came to the vaccines, and we saw this with the testing protocols here in the States too, we should have had an all of the above approach, not a pick and choose approach. And it probably costs lives. More hotel right after this. Uh, I heard tell show. Let's end up on our good note that we always try to end the program on a little lighter note. This is from our buddy, Keith Conrad. He has a great uh, newsletter you can sign up for. It gives you all kinds of fun little tidbits. Suggest you do this. Uh, This is from United Press International. A drawing purchased for $30 at a yard sale has been valued at more than $10 million after being identified as a previously unknown work by German Renaissance artist Albrecht Dürer. The London-based Ag News Gallery said Clifford Shore, a Boston-based art collector and consultant for the gallery, was in a Massachusetts bookstore in 2019 when the owner asked him to take a look at a drawing purchased by a friend. The bookseller told Shore that the drawing, which had been purchased for $30 at a yard sale in 2017, might be a drawer original. Shore said he was skeptical, but he visited the owner, who wished to remain anonymous, and a few weeks later and was shocked to see the drawing titled The Virgin and Child, appearing to be a work of drawer who died in 1528. Quote, when you're in my world, you spend your life looking for unknown things that lead to fascinating research and avenues. And I could see I was at the beginning of something extremely exciting, Sure told CNN. Sure said he spent three years traveling around the world to verify the authenticity of the piece. The art collector said the experts agree that the technical age and analysis places the drawing In the right time period, and the piece bears the hallmarks of Drewer's work, Shore says he believes the drawing could be worth more than $10 million, depending on auction. Quote, in terms of relative value, I think you have to compare it to the old master's drawings. So, never know what you might get at the yard sale. 30 bucks turned into $10 million. I'm not great at math. That's a pretty good value on return. That'll do it for Hertel today. So glad you're with us. Uh, Appreciate your time. It's the most precious thing you have, and when you share it with us, we sure do appreciate it. Uh, a lot of exciting things going on. Appreciated Dennis Saunders being on the show today. If you didn't catch the long form podcast from the weekend, uh, Dr. Catherine Gordon talking mental health. We go deep on things like access to care, things like how the pandemic affected different age groups. We have some real blunt talk about suicide prevention and suicide care and how you can see warning signs for that. She's actually written a book on suicide prevention. We get into all that with her. Plus, we talk about some pop culture stuff. If you haven't caught it yet, make sure you get that. If you're subscribed on the YouTube channel or in any of the podcast platforms, just look for Herd Tell Podcast. It's labeled that way. It's episode 33. Wherever you and yours are across the street or around the world, we sure do appreciate you. Keep subscribing. Keep watching. Keep listening. Make sure you share us on your social media. Let other people know where to find us. And we hope we find you and yours well. We hope we find you well fed. And we'll talk to you tomorrow on Herd Tell. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com.
This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.